Spring has sprung and the hottest day of the year is expected to, to arrive tomorrow with the country set to enjoy a fine, dry and a sunny weekend for the most part. And I sincerely hope that it is going to be warm in your part. Saturday will see highs of 20 degrees centigrade in northwest Scotland. Wherever that is, temperatures will be lower in the south. What? In the south, temperatures will average 17 degrees centigrade with plenty of sunshine. And that sounds like it might be nice, but the only way to tell is to translate a European surrender centigrade to Her Majesty's Imperial Fahrenheit, as Jacob Rees-Mogg would prescribe. So let's see, doing mental arithmetic, you double it and add 32, so double 17 is 53. 53 plus 32 is, okay, the one is like a, 106. <gasps> wow, it's going to be 106 degrees Fahrenheit tomorrow. Can you believe that? No. Clear skies tonight will lead to dropping temperatures to around 42.8 degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> F around 42.8 degrees Fahrenheit, you know, approximately. Not 42.9 or 42.7. It will be around 42.8. Correct. Sunday and Monday will see low pressure building with some showers in the east of the country on Sunday becoming heavier towards the south, east and the northwest of Scotland land. Yeah, I bet it will. Checking the weather for Glasgow while you wait. Aha! Uh -huh. Oh, <laughs> rubbish. <laughs> There's something wrong with my phone. It says here in Glasgow it's going to be sunny tomorrow and sunny on Sunday and sunny on Monday and sunny on Tuesday and sunny on Wednesday and sunny on Thursday and sunny on Friday. And then cloudy but dry on Saturday and Sunday and Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday. Nonsense. That phone's an idiot. Plus, people who live in Glasgow haven't got anything to wear in the sun. What are you going to do? <sighs> the brightness uh, will go away uh, down uh, and uh, everywhere else. Not in Glasgow, apparently, but the brightness is going to go away because Monday will be cloudy. Damn it. But, and it's a huge dry wobbly but, the Met Office expects an area of high pressure to return on Tuesday, bringing sunshine and happiness. You remember happiness, don't you? No. <laughs> Can you remember back that far? H A P P Y N U S. Do you remember? The meteorologist uh, Met Office uh, spokesmodel said it's going to be largely fine and dry for everyone most days in the coming week. However, what? Uh, there's a however. Oh no! He said um, there has been warning of a pollen bomb about to hit Britain due to uh, high spring temperatures. But, you know, as we've all been expecting a nuclear bomb, I think we'll take it. The wall-to-wall -wall sunshine next week will spark a huge release of early pollen, uh, especially from trees, bursting into bud. It could see millions of people rushing to buy hay fever tablets and tissues. Panic by now while they're still available. Some sufferers are already reporting runny noses, itchy eyes and headaches. Stop whining. Here's a fun fact. Hay fever symptoms tend to be uh, the worst around 11 in the morning and 6 in the evening because pollen at that time is at nose level. Pollen apparently starts off sitting on the grass at the beginning of the day and as the day warms up, the grass warms up and the pollen particles are shed and they rise into the air. At around 11 in the morning they are at nose level, 5 foot off the ground. This is a scientific fact. The pollen continues to rise with it sinking back down to nose level at about 6 p.m. Isn't that fascinating? No. So all you have to do is not breathe for an hour at 11 in the morning and 6 in the evening and you should be fine. And that is the official advice of LBC. Right, this evening, patchy low cloud and mist over Norn Island. Har, har, har. Otherwise, clear periods, a touch of frost, fog, patches, breezy. Saturday, dry, plenty of sunshine, warm in the west and the north, particularly the northwest of Scotland, if you, if you can believe that. Get it while it's here, because it's not going to be around very long. No, I wouldn't think so. Outlook for Sunday to Tuesday, mostly fine and dry with sunny spells. Blimey. Would you like to hear the long-range forecast for the next four weeks? Um... Yeah, it's like, mm, well, maybe. 
All right, this is for the end of the month, up until April the 1st. At first, dry and settled with prolonged, clear and sunny spells, feeling warm and then dry and settled, especially for the south. Windy at times, rain in the northwest, temperatures likely to be above average. That's until the uh, 1st of April. And then, for the first two weeks of April, turning more unsettled during early April with showers or longer periods of rain. These showers are likely to be heavy at times. Thunder, lightning, very, very frightening. <coughs> Drier spells are likely to be more short-lived. Temperatures mo li most likely to be slightly below average. Huh. So we'll ignore that last part and we'll concentrate on the first part about the next two weeks. The last couple of weeks of March, which you will recall are going to be are going to have a prolonged, clear and sunny spells, feeling warm with temperatures likely to be above average. <gasps> prolonged, clear and sunny spells, feeling warm with temperatures likely to be above average? We'll take it. Oh. Right. <sighs> have you heard there's something going on in Ukraine? Well, that's given the Conservatives an opportunity to roll back wokery, apparently. Thank goodness for that, because that's what everybody's concentrating on. They're going to roll, roll, roll back Wokery and sweep away the fluff of Partygate. So said Jacob Mee Smug. You're better informed than I am. I don't know anything. Uh, the minister for asking the public to tell him something good that's happened because of Brexit told a meeting of Tory activists that Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine had created a new seriousness which made woke arguments about the use of language look like nonsense. Said the man who is a six-foot plank of bespectacled nonsense. He said the Conservatives should take advantage of the situation by taking a robust approach and refusing to accept the use of socialist vocabulary, like saying chair rather than chairman, or Beijing rather than Peking. Just when you thought this ghoul couldn't get any sillier after he started an inquiry into the return of imperial measurements as a Brexit bonus, he just did. First off, what's the Tories' obsession with the use of the word robust? Absolutely everything is robust to these people. I mean, they say robust more than they say dos vadania. And second, socialist vocabulary. Socialist. Is this bloke serious? No. Well, he's not a serious person. He's a silly person. He's a wilting pile of affectations and ticks. A sort of poor man's idea of what a posh person is like. Who gathers to himself vast riches and votes against the interests of the poor and the needy while spouting on about Jesus and how pious he is. You know, if the good Lord did actually come back to walk among us again, I'd say that people like him, who use religion as a weapon, would be right at the top of the Lord's to smite list. We see you, smug. So according to him, it's socialist to say chair rather than chairman. It's a retrograde step to acknowledge that the boss might be a woman, you know. Have you ever in your life heard anything more risible than this confected, dainty twiglet? However, due to uh, current circumstances, he said he was, was willing to say Ukraine rather than the Ukraine. The Ukraine implies it's a part of Russia. But he is willing, Smug, is willing to say Ukraine rather than the Ukraine in recognition of the bravery of the Ukrainian people. Yeah, I'm sure they're very appreciative. Thank you. That, that's him doing his bit. God. Our eye has been taken off the ball by that thing that's uh, going on, uh, you know, the end of the world. It, that, it, the end of the world will actually do that to you. There's a whole lot that's been going on all the while. And I'll get to much of it later. Painful. We are being taken advantage of. Bent over a desk saying, thank you, sir, may I have another? Socialist vocabulary. <laughs> Speaking at an event hosted by Conservative Home website on the fringe of the Conservative Spring Conference in Blackpool, 
Smug said that the war had exposed the scandal over pandemic parties at Number 10 Downing Street as a trivial distraction from issues of real importance. <laughs> said the guy who's trying to bring back inches and feet. Pounds and ounces. Shillings and pence. Nice try, Smug. No sale. They were laws that your party brought in. The pandemic laws. And people were fined for ignoring them. People obeyed those laws. Even the blooming queen who sat alone at her husband's funeral. And thousands could not see their loved ones before they died because of the laws that you brought in while all the time your party parted like it was 1999. Rock and roll! You do not get a pass because the bloke that's been funding your party went bananas and invaded a foreign country. No. And furthermore... No, 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 no. Your lot were guilty before, they're guilty now, and will continue to be guilty, and absolutely no one should let them off the hook. Just because this charmless sundial tells us that we're being silly for not forgetting about it. Smug said the Ukraine crisis was a reminder that the world is serious and that there are serious things to be discussed and serious and difficult decisions for politicians to take, whether this is about reopening and having new licences for oil wells in the North Sea or whether it is about getting away from the wokery that has beset huge sections of society. That's what he said. OK, first off, keeping us reliant on oil and gas is playing right into Russia's hands. There's not enough oil or gas in the North Sea to last, and it will take ages to reopen wells, and fracking will take maybe decades, and anyone who says that we should be doubling down on fossil fuels is doing Vladimir Putin's work for him. And as for this made-up culture war nonsense about wokery that served the Tories so well for so long, it's your lot that keep that fire burning. If you just stop clutching your pearls to your chest in this fake Victorian fainting fit every time you're asked to consider the feelings of someone else, it wouldn't be such a thing. But you won't let it go, because it riles up your fans, who might otherwise spend their time wondering where all those benefits of the Brexit you sold them are, and why they're so poor when you told them they'd be so well off. Smug said, in the aftermath of Putin's invasion, nobody cares about rows over words which may offend people. Well. Why are you bringing it up then, you dissembling hat stand? All that nonsense has shown up for the trivial nature of it, he said, and that we're now looking at serious, difficult decisions that have to be made. I would say the same about Partygate, he said. All of that is shown up for the disproportionate fluff of politics, rather than something of fundamental seriousness about the safety of the world and the established global order. What is he talking about? We must forget anything that does not affect the established world order. So all those fines for breaking COVID rules will be paid back. And pretty much anyone in jail should be released immediately. Of course, the reverse should be true of any politician that's taking money from dodgy Russians and has allowed Vlad the Insaner to infiltrate British politics. That would be of fundamental seriousness about the safety of the world and the established global order. Smug said, when we look back in 36 years at Partygate, people will think, what were they on about? They were moving from Covid to Russia and Ukraine, yet they were distracted by whether or not the PM spent five minutes in his own garden. It's fundamentally trivial, he said. And translated from the supercilious to English, that means that anything a Tory minister does is none of our business. And anyone who says otherwise will be dealt with under the new crime and sentencing bill. The Ukraine crisis meant that politics were recalibrated with a new seriousness, he said. And he said that this provided a job for Conservatives to do. A new seriousness. So here's what Mr New Seriousness said next. He said, as Conservatives, We've bought in over the last 20 years to socialist language. And that is a terrible mistake. 
we shouldn't do that, he said. We should definitely say chairman, not chairperson. We shouldn't allow the beginnings of woke language to feed in because when you begin to accept their argument, because then rather you begin to accept their argument. He said, we should be, here it comes again, robust about how we use the language. If we just seed the ground, then wokery advances. But when serious things happen and wokery is in retreat, we should make these arguments, said Mr. New Seriousness. Despite saying he'd switched from the Ukraine to Ukraine in light of the crisis, Smug said he had no view on supermarket Sainsbury's decision to rename its Chicken Kiev Ready Meals Chicken Kiev. He said, Ugh, it's not a dish I would eat, he said. That dangerous stuff, garlic. <laughs> garlic. He said, um, as I'm not going to eat it, I don't really mind what you call it. He said his own six children had, had avoided indoctrination with the woke terminology they heard at school. God. He said they get taught the normal politesse of the chattering classes and they come, came home and say, they come home and say, this is all ridiculous, this is what we've been told, and it isn't funny at all. He said, it's absolutely fascinating how children are not perhaps quite as susceptible to indoctrination as we may think. Well, I think he's just proved that his own children seem to have been indoctrinated quite robustly by their ludicrous, phony, upper-class twit of a father. Please explain to me, people of North East Somerset, why you keep voting for this hollow, soulless, taxidermied stick insect. Why? Anybody care what this guy thinks? No! Laura texts, whenever my uh, MP, which is smug, is spotted in the village, someone posts about it in our village Facebook group. He looks like a fish out of water ne <laughs> next to the pound land on the high street. <laughs> and what is a pound land? Andrew emails all this talk of Armageddon, but don't worry, Arnold Schwarzenegger is on the case. Correct. All we can muster is Cameron <laughs> in his van driving to Poland. Haven't the people suffered enough? Yeah, we're still not missing you, by the way, uh, David Cameron, but um, we know where to find you when we do. You'll be in the shed where they keep the tools. I think this is nonsense. Mm. Yeah, that um, video that uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger did uh, was, um, I thought it was pretty good. Affirmative. I am talking to you. <laughs> I mean, he, he must be, what, like a, a hundred, 150 years old. And he still looks great. Still looks like somebody you wouldn't want to meet in an alleyway. I challenge you, Vladimir Putin, to a fight with uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Not a fight with, uh, you know, one of your lackeys that uh, just uh, rolls over as soon as you touch them. An actual real fight. Uh, Streatham. Hello, Robbie. Hi there. Yep. Robbie. Yeah, hi. Yes, Robbie, you sound surprised. You called me. Oh, no one told me that we're putting me on. Oh, That's right. we're putting you on. Oh, excellent, Nick. Thank you very much indeed. Look, uh, I was looking at this um, DP World... I'm oh, doing yeah. a bit of investigation on the internet for as much information as I can find. Yeah, doing your own research, yes. Yeah, that's correct. And um, basically, oh, I just noticed please. that DP... Less of the sniffing. Oh, sorry about right that. In my yeah, ear. That, was, that was in stereo. Disgusting. Awful. I'm hoping that I haven't got COVID, actually, at the moment. Right. Well, but, I, uh, I, think, maybe... I think I might get it off you. Maybe it's just, uh, maybe it's just hay fever. Uh, um, anyway, so anyway. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I think perhaps it's perhaps uh, I was in the air when it was at nose level. Yes, exactly. Don't breathe in uh, at eleven in the morning or six in the evening. The stuff you learn on this show, educational, ain't it? No. Go on. Well, I've got a mask actually. I might wear a mask instead. You know, yeah. a, a nuclear fallout mask. Right. So anyway, um, where are we? I noticed that DP World um, is doing a deal with um, some Russian oligarch. They're very very close a joint venture in in uh, a Russian port. Yes, Dubai apparently. and Russia, or the UAE in general, are um, like this, all hugger mugger with uh, the Russians. Well, Vlad yeah, exactly. in particular, yeah. Their best I was buddies. wondering how, how much money, uh, oligarch money, is uh, invested Tons. in... Tons! Uh... <laughs>
Exactly. And I'm wondering if it's deeply wealthy. It's a, sort of like a, a political move and uh, to put pressure on uh, the workers in this country. Uh, I, well, I don't think they need to put pressure on the workers in this country because the, the government has done an excellent job for them. Well, I know. I know. It's just extra pressure, isn't it? Right. OK, <laughs> thanks a lot, Robbie. 0345 6060 973. I'll talk about that later. I have no idea whether there's any um, Russian oligarch money in uh, anything that that bloke just said, but there's, there certainly is UAE money all over Russia. They are allies, which I wouldn't be remotely surprised uh, might explain why that happened, the P&O firing happened, when uh, his imperial bodgeness was uh, over there begging them to uh, turn on the oil taps. Eh, hey, Bodge? Yeah, 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 yeah. Where, 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 where do we... Laughing at you, they are. He was crawling across the carpet, begging them for, uh, you know, a, li a little extra squirt of oil. <laughs> and <laughs> meanwhile, they were concocting a story that would embarrass him hugely, you know, assuming that he actually was capable of embarrassment, which we all know is uh, not true. <sighs> what a way to run a country, eh? Dreadful. Laura texts, oh no, I've read that. That's Smug in the Village with Poundland. That sounds like, um, I don't know, that's, that, that sounds like an excellent name for, an, uh, for a band, doesn't it? Smug in the Village with Poundland. It actually sounds like a bad Beatles song. <laughs> Get Paul McCartney on the phone and he'll put it on his set list for Glastonbury. Sharon tweets, I wish Nick would get himself off that fence and tell us what he really thinks of Jacob Rees-Mogg. <laughs> I think he's beyond despicable. Those f that, that phony politeness that he uses as a weapon. And don't get me started on the religion bit. Look up his, uh, his voting record and ask yourself, is that what Jesus would do? And the answer is... No. And... No, 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 no. It's... Negative. And... No. Yeah. All of those things. No. Yeah. Definitely not. Oh, look at the time. Blimey, is that the time already? Don't it fly when you're out of your mind. 0345 6060 973. Text 84850. Email nickA at lbc.co.uk. And if you're on Twitter, it's at LBC. Friday, Saturday, Sunday night at 10. Nick Abbott, LBC. It's 10.30. The news headlines with Serena Farrow. Do not panic. Do not panic. We are trained professionals. 0345 6060 973. Gordon texted, Putin just had... Rootin' Tootin' shooting Putin had just have his equivalent of a MAGA rally in R Russia today. Yeah, he did, yes. <laughs> Yeah, he did. I wonder where he got uh, that idea from, he said. Yeah, Donald Trump's very annoyed. I'd like to punch him in the face. Yeah, go ahead. Go right ahead, Donny. I'll actually, um, I'll, I'll pay a lot of money to see it. Edward texts, Nick, I'm not surprised that Smug defended Bodger today. Smug knows he will not be offered another job as prominent or as cushy on the payroll from any other PM as he has under this one. I think completely correct in every respect. <laughs> I think that also applies to every single one of the other ministers in this catastrophic clown show that's running this country. All of them look like look at uh, Bodge with uh, with doughy eyes. They're like they're in love. L U V. Want to give him a great, a great big kiss? Moi. Tell him that I love him. Tell him that I care. Tell him that I'll always be there. Rock and roll. The Shangri La's. Let's get the best of the Shangri La's on the show right now. We got the Shangri La's. Hmm? <laughs> you see what I have to deal with? <sighs> 0345 6060 <laughs> uh, right, let's have um, York. Hello, Jan. Hello, Nick. Jan. How are you tonight? I am great, mate. Good. Do you know, you did a cracking job with your serious hat on, but um, it's fabulous to have you back to normal tonight. I am busting out all over like the month of June. Mmm. It really is good. Did you enjoy it, though? But the serious part. Your serious hat, yeah. Um, I enjoy doing the... I enjoy that it's different, because uh, it really is, um, but I wish that it hadn't been quite so serious. 
Yeah. That's a shame, isn't it, really? It seems so long ago. I mean, I can remember doing that show when I, I talked to this guy in uh, yeah, Reparisia, something like yeah, that. Yeah, when the nuclear plant was attacked, yeah. yeah. That night, yeah. Oh, God. Yeah, you were sp speechless, weren't you? I was, yeah. I've, I've rarely ever been speechless on the radio. I think that was the, yeah. the most speechless I've ever been. Um, yeah. If if you didn't hear it about half past ten, something like that, Reparisia, I think I've got that right. Uh, this bloke, uh, an English guy who was staying there, called in, told us told us what was happening. He said something like, you know, we we hear a gunfire, look away in the distance, uh, but it, they they might be coming here. And, and then about two hours later, just before I was going off the air. Mm. In came this news that these morons were firing um, weaponry at the nuclear power station just down the road from where this guy was that I'd been uh, talking to. And yeah. um, I think I must have left such a long period of silence that I, I thought, oh, I better say something because if I don't, the emergency tape is going to kick in and it will be Steve Allen talking about biscuits. <laughs> <laughs> and then at the end of the show, you usually say, um, I'll be back tonight at 10, don't you? Yeah. And you didn't say it that night. Well, I wasn't sure. Well, I know, and I thought, oh, dear. And I, I drove home in a bit of a daze, really, mm. and um, I didn't think I'd get any sleep, but I did. I went straight to sleep, and I woke up the next morning, and, and I... My first thing was to look out the window to see if the if there was, like, a, a, an odd colour in the sky. See if we were, we were still alive, yeah? Yeah, exactly. Oh, dear. Yeah. Anyway, Jacob Rees-Mogg. <sighs> anyway, yeah. If he, um, if he thinks we're all going to forget about Partygate, as mm. he calls it... Right. I think he's mistaken, don't you? I do. Yeah, I blooming well hope so. The people of this country should not let these people get away with it. Well, certainly not. You know, I, oh, I mean, people have, people have already people have already stopped talking about unseating his bodgeness, as though we're, we've all forgotten about that now that there's mm. uh, that there's a war on. That, well, how can that forgotten. bloke be so lucky? Seriously, one yeah. thing after the next comes along and saves him. He's either he is either the devil or he's made a pact with him. Probably that, yeah. And aren't they all going to get a pay rise as well? <laughs> yes. <laughs> that uh, that yeah. is ridiculous, I think. Yeah, it's it's actually really? it's worse than that, and I'll come to that later. Really? Good. Yeah. Because right. uh, there's been an, a long period that's been excellent to very bad news, and they mm. have done just that. Mm. I Painful. know, they must think we're all, they must think we're all balmy. Uh, I think they think that we're all gullible, and the reason they think that is because we are. We just keep falling for the same old lines over and over and over again. Like, oh, look, there's a dinghy just over there. <laughs> Vote Conservative. Mm, yeah. Well, I don't know. No, I don't know either, Jan. No. But it's I painful. Don't. It is painful, very painful. Yeah. But anyway, it is great to have you back to normal tonight. Uh, okay, well, as I call it, is this normal? <laughs> 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 All right, thanks a lot, Jan. All right, cheers, my dear. Ta da! Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. Nigel emails. Can you think of a group of people you'd like to fire and rehire? I can, although I might skip the rehire bit. Yes, let's make a list. The pay rise. Well, I'll get to that later. I might explode if I talk about it now. But it's worse than the pay rise. They're not only giving themselves a pay rise. It's worse than that. But I'll get to that in a while. This P&O thing. You know, there was a, um, a, a, a... As far as I'm aware, it was a Labour MP's... Um, uh, uh, what do they call it? Um, a private members bill that was put forward to ban the, uh, the employment practice of dismissing and then re-engaging on the worst contract. It was called the Employment and Trades Union Rights Bill of Dismissal and Re-Engagement, and it was chucked out. The nose to the left, or the right it would be, 249. The eyes to the left, 173. The guess which party threw it out. Go on, I'll I'll, um, I'll I'll give you a while. Go ahead, guess. Correct Amundo. 
every single person who voted no to protect workers' rights from being dismissed and then rehired on a worse contract, every single one that said no was a Tory. All of them. Not one single Tory said no. We do, um, uh, we want to respect uh, employment rights. And then they have the absolute gall to show up and uh, and profess their uh, support with the uh, workers of uh, that just got fired by P and O. I tell you, it's, it, uh, the um, did you see the mail? Oh, didn't take long, did it? Headline: Union mob turns on MP. <laughs> Union mob. Yesterday it was oh these poor people. Now they're a union mob. It took less than 24 hours. Union mob turns on MP as angry P&O ferries uh, protests break out. Tory hating union members turned on Dover's Conservative MP Natalie Elphick. Y you know Conservative MP Natalie Elphick, don't you? No! Yeah, that's her. She came out to support them. I'm waggling my fingers in the air to denote inverted commas to support them over the P&O Ferries jobs massacre of 800 uh, crew, as it was revealed the... the uh, OK, if you haven't heard, get ready, grip onto something firm. The government knew about the plan the day before. What? They knew about it the day before, uh, they didn't say anything about it, and they didn't do anything about it, and they haven't done anything about it now. Conservative MP Natalie Elphick even held a Save Britain's Ferries banner at the event. <laughs> wow, really putting yourself out there. <laughs> we appreciate the cooperation. Thank you. A banner. She held a banner at the event with Labour's hard left former shadow chancellor John MacDonald. Sounds like a communist to me amid calls for the Dubai-owned business to hand back their £10 million furlough cash. Yeah, that's your money. £10 million quid. £10 million to furlough workers that they went ahead and fired anyway. We supported them with furlough and they should be backing Britain and backing Dover. Said, uh, I don't know whether it was Natalie Elphick or um, John MacDonald. Doesn't really matter. When she began speaking on TV, Dover's Conservative MP Natalie Elphick about the sackings being devastating for the Kent town, union activists, you know, this mob, they started screaming, we hate Tories. Well, <laughs> with good reason. We are the Tory haters, they said. Now, you don't have to say both. Either say we hate Tories or we are the Tory haters. I mean, that's just saying the same thing twice. Shame on you, they said. You're on their side, they said. You voted for fire and rehire, and forcing her to abandon her interview. She said, right, right that's it, I'm going. Bye-bye. <laughs> One protester confronted her, saying, Tory anti-union laws allow bosses to get away with this. Natalie Elphick, the Conservative MP for Dover, said, nonsense. It's bad business behaviour, and then she walked off. So I checked, and big surprise, Natalie Elphick did vote down a law that would have protected workers from fire and rehire, the one that I was just talking about, the Employment and Trades Union Rights Bill of uh, 2021, which was deliberately and specifically aimed at stopping this firing and then rehiring thing. She was challenged, Tory anti-union laws allow bosses to get away with this. Her response was, nonsense. She voted it out. In fact, every single one of the MPs that voted down that Labour Party private members bill was a Conservative. And finally, the message seems to have been getting through to the workers, because those workers are exactly the demographic that voted for the Conservatives at the last election. Are you beginning to get the feeling you've been had? Um... Think about it. 
0345 6060 973. Text 84850. Email nick a at lbc.co.uk. If you're on Twitter, it's at LBC. Friday, Saturday, Sunday night at 10. Nick Abbott, LBC. 0345 6060 973. Oh, I've got to do a thing. Hi, honey. How are you? I'm super. Thanks for asking. Ranjit text, unfortunately all the crooked politicians around the world are growing in numbers and with the apathy from the voting public it will only increase. Can't pick a hole in that. Uh, let's have a call in Guildford. Hello, Peter. Hello, Nick. How are you? I'm great, mate. Good. Um, I was just wondering, now that we send the oligarchs and we send our... How stained the Tory party is with stained. Russian money. Oh. Yeah, well, we're infected, yeah, it with Russian money. Yeah. We're seeing the cost of living crisis. Mm -hmm. We're seeing... Uh, uh, I've lost my train of thought. Oh, we're seeing no. the way the... Tre <laughs> we're seeing the way that um, the P&O workers are being treated. Yes. Uh, in a way that the Tory party wanted them to oh, be treated. Of course. What, do you think that the... That the voters out there that voted Tory will mm -hmm. give them an even bigger majority at the next election. Yes, I because do. Because they'll be so pleased. Yeah, I do. Because it seems to me that we're the rich and powerful and those that own the right-wing newspapers mm -hmm. have done a terrific job. They've actually managed to persuade people who have nothing to vote for a party that supports the rich as against the party that wants to make their lives better. Amazing, they, but true. They see, uh, they see the trade unions as enemies. Mm -hmm. And they see business as somehow wonderful. You know, and then when something like this comes along, they say, hang on a minute, that don't seem right. And then you've got Tory ministers, Nick, that come out and, and they look absolutely disgusted with it all. <laughs> we're, 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 although we voted to make it easier for people to hire and re fire and rehire, yeah, yeah. we didn't expect them to actually, actually do it. Actually do it? No, quite right. Yeah, that's what they're pretending at the moment. Yeah, they're they're um, they're, they're thinking, oh no, surely not, not under our watch. And um, I, I I guess they just wake up laughing because there's just enough people in this country who are still buying it to give them a stonking majority. Incredible. Yeah, I mean, the idea as well that that they're talking about, oh, let's forget what Bodger did with the, the parties and all that. Uh, you know, he's a war hero now. He's the next Winston Churchill, they think. <laughs> you know, and and we're supposed to forget all that. When yep. he broke the law, which it uh, turned out he probably has, right. and people say, oh, well, you know, Never I mean, mind. he has been a great wartime leader. Yeah, that's right. It's, it's, it's bizarre. It can is you bizarre. imagine? Can you imagine Rhys Mogg supporting the left wing of the Labour Party and saying, "I want higher taxes on the rich. I want to really hit them hard." No, you'd never see that. But you see, working class people on minimum wage and sometimes going to food banks who support the Tory Party, who want to make their lives even harder. It's it's incredible. It's it, it is really weird that the demographic that votes that voted the Conservative Party in are the the poor old and the poor young. By a large margin, it's those that are the most in need voted for the party that's going to do the least for them. And the and the only explanation I can find is look, a dinghy. <coughs> it's the <coughs> gift that keeps on giving. Yeah. repelling foreigners, which is why, of course, the government was so um, uh, f so lax about their response to the refugee crisis. It, it wasn't by accident. It, it wasn't a mistake. It's the plan. Well, that, that, that's, that's very true. They just point to, oh, there's foreigners coming over. Oh, oh, and, oh, watch out for them. They're the enemy, you know. And it is strange how they were so, like you said, on another show, it's strange how they're so sort of reluctant to even let Ukrainian people over. You know, they they put every hurdle imaginable. Yeah, it, it's not strange. It's that it's what they thought their fans would want because that is, after all, the how they managed to cling mm. on to power all this time by making you fearful of others. They they managed to. Re they've been really clever. What were their friends in the right wing press? They've been really clever in turning poor people against 
poor people. Yeah. And they support... They look at a billionaire and they don't say, well, there's a man there who's got too much. No one minds someone being rich, but when you're super, super, super rich and you're paying no tax, then questions... Should, but they don't look at it that way. They blame their neighbour. They, oh, they, oh. well, in a nutshell, we have been trained to blame those below us on the ladder mm. for the problems that we are experiencing rather than to direct the blame where it actually belongs to those above us on the ladder pushing us down. It's not the people below us on the ladder pulling us down, it's those above us pushing us down. Yeah, it is, and we fall for it all day. Every, every time, every single time. time. Yeah, amazing. And it, it, it does make me think, well, uh, I really do think, I, I heard once that Labour would need to win 100 seats or something in order to get a majority of one. I don't know whether that's right or not. But if that's the case, then, my God, we've got a hell of a job. It's worse than that because they're, they're, the Conservative Party seem to be actually engaging in what the Republican Party have done in America and making it more difficult for those who might not vote Conservative to actually show mm, up to vote in the first yeah, place. That's true. All of this ID stuff, mm. solving a problem that doesn't exist. How, how on, uh, what worries me is how on earth, with even laws on protest now, yeah. how on earth <laughs> do, do people... Yeah, how do we get our message across? They seem to have a lock on, on, on <laughs> a lock everything. lock on people's minds. Yeah, wake up, sheeple. It's later than you think. All right, thanks a lot, Peter. I know, it's galling, isn't it? The only way in which the system can become fairer is proportional representation. Over half of the votes cast in this country count for nothing. Zero. I mean, the Tories got, what, 40... Four, or was it 46%? And that was of the people that could, could actually be bothered to go out and vote. I think it was a 70% turnout last time around, something like that. Which is remarkably high, apparently. Well done, everybody. <laughs> you managed to uh, make it to 300 yards to the uh, polling booth at the end of your road. Congratulations. Of course, 30% of us couldn't be bothered because, you know, oh, it's like so boring. I don't want to. Oh, they're all the same. You know, <laughs> all these... Stupid arguments that come out every time. The masses are asses. That's just a fact. It's almost as though they deserve what they get, but the rest of us don't. So the majority always get ignored under the system that we have at the moment, which suits the Conservative Party just fine, because the people that vote for them will crawl over broken glass to vote for them. And it is, and I'm sorry to have to say this, the old, old people are the problem. Pretty much everywhere you look, old people are the problem. How old is uh, Vlad the Insaner? I rest my face. <sighs> anyway, uh, Ashley says... Surely an employee is only redundant if their job no longer exists. If these jobs at P&O really no longer exist, what are all these agency workers going to do? Oh, no, you've blown my mind, Ashley. Uh, and Tom has texts, but imagine the alternative. Corbyn, that horrible commie who wanted to feed the children and get billionaires to give back a bit more. <laughs> I mean, the cheek on this guy. Yeah, thank God that we, uh, you know, we, we uh, didn't uh, suffer that. <sighs> what a way to run a country, eh? Dreadful. 0345 6060 973. Text 84850. Email nick a at lbc.co.uk. And if you're on Twitter, it's at lbc. Um, well, things I want to talk about include, but are not limited to, a very strange uh, thing I found today about that P&O thing was um, an organisation that seemed to be, on the face of it, actually um, working towards that result. Now, I know that that's a bit vague, but I'll fill in the gaps for you. Um, there was also a pay rise issue for MPs, and like I said before, it's worse than that <gasps> wow text just come in 
Andy texts, Nick, you are an old people. <laughs> Offensive. Hello, boys. 0345 6060 973. Susan texts, the P&O workers should embrace their seafaring heritage, commit mutiny and confiscate the ships until new and reasonable terms are agreed. Let the Tory backbenchers hand wrangle about that. <laughs> hand wrangle? I don't think I've heard that one before. Sounds awful. Disgusting. Uh, hands above the tables. Richie texts, Mog lives in Brideshead Revisited Land where his teddy is more important than the normal person in the street. He wouldn't recognise a normal person in the street if his chauffeur drove over one. 0345 6060 973. Seriously, people of North Somerset, why do you keep voting for him? What is it about him that makes you keep voting for him? I'm, I'm really curious. I mean, it's not a wealthy place. I think it's that the, we Brits have been... Um, uh, been um, we've had it inculcated into us to be uh, deferential to those uh, what speak uh, posh, in it, uh, And then we all start doffing our caps, falling to the floor. Uh, I mean, and it's like an instinctual reaction, like Pavlov's dogs. Uh, and then we, we, we... Just whatever you say, your lordship. Uh. <laughs> It's so affected. Uh, all of that. Painful. But, you know, that's what we Brits like. We know our place. That is the basis of our society. Knowing our place. God bless you, Governor. <laughs> uh, Peter emails. Hey, Nick, have you seen the Facebook page for the Russian embassy in London? No. He says, you will be shocked at the propaganda posts. I replied to several posts, adding the video of the Russian TV protest. Not only did they delete all my comments, but they blocked me too. Why is Facebook allowing them to continue to post propaganda? Well, I don't know. I would look it up, Peter, but if I... I'm frightened of starting Facebook on my phone because I, I know it'll just like infest my phone and I'll get updates from people I don't know every three seconds my phone will be bleeping at me. So um, I, I just don't open Facebook. It seems like a really simple thing, Facebook, but it's fiendishly complicated. I don't quite understand it. I mean, every now and again, once in a blue moon, I will post that, you know, I'm going to be on tonight or you can um, listen to my podcast. Oh, uh, you know what? I do a podcast with, with Karen McGithin. Oh, right, yeah. And I'll post that on Facebook. But I, I, I never really know which bit to post it on because I've got a ordinary Facebook page, like a lot of people have, which I never use, like ever. Um, and then I've got uh, a page page. Weirdly, they call a professional's page a page, I think. And I can't... I never know how to get to it. I don't know which bit to uh, post on. So I just start st stabbing randomly at bits of the screen. And eventually, after about five minutes, I find the place that I want. <laughs> it seems so simple, but it seems to be deliberately, fiendishly complicated. And they keep changing it all the time. It's like you go into a supermarket and you know where uh, everything is, you know, you know where the cake is, and you know where the crisps are. And then every now and again they just change it all around. Damn it. You don't know where anything is anymore. <sighs> but you know me, I never complain. Whinging and whining and moaning. And, um... Yeah, I, so, uh, I, I, but I'm very, um... Um... Uh... uh whatever the word is, about uh, opening Facebook on my phone. Very uh, nervous about it. Not quite the word I was after, but it will do in an emergency. I'm um, uh, trepidatious. There you go. <coughs> trepidatious about opening Facebook on my phone because I know it'll, it'll like, change all of my settings. My beautiful settings. So I won't do it. Uh, so I will just have to take your word for it, Peter, that the uh, Facebook page for the Russian Embassy in London is um, spouting propaganda. Can <laughs> you believe that? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Why are you even looking at it? Are you um, taking up the fight yourself, Peter? Good for you. Every little helps. They blocked him for doing it. 
well, I, I would be uh, quite concerned if I were you, mate. I, I'd move <laughs> under cover of darkness. And if a stranger offers you tea, don't take it. Let's have a call in Tottenham. Hello, Tom. What, Tottenham? Tottenham. Oh, I'm right here. Look, I've got to turn the speaker off. Uh, sorry. There you are. OK, I do beg your pardon. I ran off for a minute. I had to take care of a call of nature. But uh, you didn't oh, need to know that. A little bit too much information there. I know. I'm very sorry about that. Yeah, Look, okay, what about yeah. the Tory party? What about them? Uh, uh, well, what do the Tories want? Them in power all the time. I don't think they do. They want an opposition. The Telegraph was blasting on about that a few years ago. And uh, you were mentioning Corbyn, you know... Wait a minute, wait, wait, thought... wait, 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 back up. The Telegraph Okay, was... yes, I'm being confused. The... You're being confused or confusing? I'm being confusing. You're being confusing or... Because if you were being confused, that would imply that I am confusing you. I got the right idea or, of what I was rambling on about, but I'm, I'm not being concise, which I was trying to be. <laughs> Ask me a question. <laughs> I think there... Look, when you close look, your I, eyes, I think there are when you Tories. close your eyes, Tom, what colour do you see? Do you do you see like paisley shapes, or um, like a pyramid with an eye on top of it, something like that? Groovy. I'm afraid I've had telephonic problems. Right. Well, that's um, that is a matter for you. Have I lost you altogether? No, I'm still with you. And I need you so badly. You're. Dropping breadcrumbs behind you. I can follow you so far. Go ahead. That shut him up. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead, Tom. Speak to me. He's gone. O three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. In a nutshell, he said. <laughs> Phil says, did you notice how the UK government slipped out the small inconsequential fact that HS two needs another nine hundred million pounds? <laughs> Can't or won't feed the hungry children, just like uh, Jesus, but they've got money for a new train set, says Phil. I did not see that. HS2 needs another £900 million. What? Not a billion, mind. Very specifically, £900 million. So if they say it needs another £900 million, then that'll be an another £1.8 billion, won't it? I mean, that's how these things work. That is just basic maths. Affirmative. What for? It's going to be ten years late and ten times the original stated price, and it won't work. We know that that's true. And it will be ancient technology by the time they build it. And which country are we getting those? Are we are we getting to build it? By the way, it's not China, is it? Oh no! Who's providing the uh, the railway carriages? Is it China? If only this was TV, I'd go into a sort of weird thing every time I do that. Um, I can't help it. I, I do a Donald Trump thing. It's, it's, there's a lot of it in the hands. China. But not television, though. Simon says, Nick, is this out of touch or plain trolling? Johnson does a speech about protecting democracy, and Car Cameron is volunteering for a charity which helps feed the poor. Wow, says Simon. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I think that's uh, maximum gaslighting. We're, we're up to gas, um, gas mark five now. And the, the worrying thing is, we can't afford that. Concert, County Durham. Hello, Sean. Hello, mate. How are you doing? Great, mate. I've got a, quick, a couple of quick points for you, right? So that uh, Putin done a Trump the day, like, maybe this is his last farewell. Well, wouldn't that, you know be I mean? nice? wouldn't that be like, nice? Wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't it just... Yeah, don't let the door hit you on the way out. Bye-bye. <laughs> I was watching the, the Sky News the day there, and uh, halfway to Johnson was on the television, mm -hmm. making a fool of himself. What was he doing now? Sky, and Sky News cut him off, and they never went back to him when he was live <laughs> talking. <hey. laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> Good for them. I thought, was, I thought it was fantastic the Sky News cutting him off. Yeah. Like, yeah, that, yeah, they they just said boring, and then went to the ads. Yeah. Well, I definitely think I definitely think this is this is Putin's last. Uh, uh, I think it's his last farewell on Earth. I think. Right. But so he was singing today on stage, wasn't he? Maybe he's auditioning for the X Factor. <laughs> Too late, Vlad. They've cancelled it. 
But uh, I, I honestly think the bloke has lost his mind. Like, I, I definitely think I, th I definitely think he's got a disease. Like, well, he might have a disease. He might. He, he, do, he looks a bit puffy in the face. So, he, but I don't know about the losing his mind part any more than he had already lost his mind. I mean. You, if you're a psychopath, does that mean that you've actually lost your mind? Or, or are you thinking rationally to achieve the ends that you are after? Because that... Well, they were saying, they were saying in the paper there that he had uh, taken tablets for certain things and cancer and things like that. Maybe he has. Maybe he has and maybe he is losing his mind. What galls me is there's six billion people on this planet. Six, not million billion six uh -huh. billion people every single one of us is being put at peril uh, and uh, uh, and at, at a minimum a massive economic disadvantage by one bloke one i've just seen it on the news there before there that all the dead bodies that are lying on the floor in streets over in ukraine right how can the world sit back and watch this like well, like I said, one bloke. Well, they need to wipe them out as soon as possible, I think. ASAP, yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe that's what uh, David Cameron is, like, his, his, his secret mission. <laughs> 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 maybe he's um, he's got a, a pie van loaded up with high cholesterol products and he's uh, planning on, uh, you know, force-feeding them. <laughs> Breakfast, lunch and dinner. Exactly. All right. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Sean. Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. Sanj texts. Hi, Nick. When we were in the EU, we had workers' rights. Since then, the RMT have been popping up, protesting with the P and O workers. Yet, if you look on their website, they ask their members to vote Leave to secure their jobs and get better pay, as Europeans were bringing down their wages and living standards. Sanj, you are. It's, it's like you're psychic, because I have detailed files. He says, the government are a bunch of hypocrites. They voted against workers' rights. Why, oh, why do the people who have the least keep voting them in? That's an excellent question. Um, that uh, Sue, uh, what's her name, who writes for The Guardian, was asking this. And I was just trying to look up the column because I, I, didn't, um, I didn't bring it with me. But I did read it. It was, uh, what's her name? You know, that, the, the woman from The Thing. <laughs> Am I being specific enough? I can't remember what her name is. She's a very famous uh, writer in The Guardian. I mean, anyway, a, a column was about why do old people keep voting for the Conservative Party? Over and over and over again, they get shafted and they keep voting for the same blooming party that, uh, that uh, did it to them the last time. Again and again and again and again and again. Like I said before, wake up, sheeple. It's later than you think. It's mystifying. Look at the demographics. For the people who voted for the Conservative Party last time round, the poor and the old. It's amazing. It's the opposite to what you would think. You'd think it would be the rich. No. Incorrect. The poor and the old overwhelmingly voted Conservative. Why? Perhaps it's because the last 11 years of a Labour government under the disastrous premiership of Jeremy Corbyn. Oh, no, that's right. It wasn't him. Explain it to me, I double dare you. It's mystifying. Other than... There's a dinghy. I mean, is, is that it? Is that really it? We're about to have a tsunami of foreigners vote Conservative? I can't think of anything else, can you? 0345 973 text 84850, email nick a at lbc.co.uk. If you're on Twitter, it's at LBC. Friday, Saturday, Sunday night at 10, Nick Abbott, LBC. I think he's betraying a quite stupefying ignorance. Right, here's that um, RMT story. Transport Union RMT. This is 2016 before the uh, ew referendum. Transport Union, RMT, today set out... Six, oh, I don't know why I'm doing it in that accent. Set out six key reasons why it will be advising members to vote to leave the European Union in the forthcoming referendum. You ready? 
So this is the RMT, the very union that represents these people who uh, have just been uh, fired by P&O. Before the referendum, they were advising their members to vote to leave the EU. Now, before I get into that, there is a little bit of a background. This was in the, the New Statesman by Anoush Chakilian. I've got no idea who that is, but they are excellent in every regard, I'm sure. Anoush Chakilian says, Leaving the European Union, Brexiters argued that it would mean an end to importing low-cost European labour that undercut British workers. You remember that? An end to low-cost European labour undercutting British workers. How's that going, by the way? Oh, fabulous. But the P&O mass layoff exposes this argument as a red herring. The problem was not freedom of movement, but a loosely regulated labour market and poorly enforced labour laws, particularly relating to agency work and bogus self-employment. Time and again, she said, is that a she? It. <laughs> Offensive. Anoush says, time and again, I've come across unscrupulous employers outsourcing work to agencies that pay lower wages and allow fewer rights to their workers than permanent employees receive. From hotel maids, office cleaners, uh, carers working under shoddy agency conditions to gig economy workers like uh, drivers and couriers fighting for labour rights. I have reported on the many cracks and grey areas of UK employment rights over the years. Well, cracks implies that it's, a, a, it's an error, it's a mistake. Not a mistake, it's the plan. Anoush says they existed before Brexit, now it looks like they will persist after it, despite Bodger Johnson's promise of a high-wage, high-skill economy. <laughs> yeah, right, that's what it'll be. High-wage, high-skill. Uh, Anoush says, indeed, the owners of P&O Ferries, a Dubai-based multinational called DP World, are also a major investor in the first post-Brexit free port. That was another uh, thing that they sold to us. Oh, we'll be able to have these free ports now we leave the European Union. They're fantastic. They'll be great. <laughs> Forgetting about the part that you can already... Uh, countries in the European Union can already have free ports. Indeed, we had about half a dozen of them uh, ourselves already and we uh, shut them down because they weren't really working another lie on a giant pyramid of lies still never mind and and, and if you think that um, workers rights are bad out you know in uh, this country as it is try getting a job in a free port call me back and tell me uh, how it's going for you Anoush says, if staff can be laid off by multinationals like this while agency workers, whether from the UK, Europe or beyond, can be made to fill in on the cheap, then Brexit has failed on its own terms. Well, that implies that what the terms that were sold to us in order to persuade us to vote Brexit were uh, actually true, but I don't think that they were. I think Brexit has succeeded on its terms, which were to make a vanishingly few number of people fabulously rich. They woke up with gold in their mouths, you remember? She said, she, he, Anoush says, a dull technical slog that involved catching the UK's labour laws up with modern working practices, beefing up its enforcement agencies and empowering trade unions would have helped keep these ravages of globalisation in check. But there's no handy three-word slogan like, get Brexit done for that. Correct. So here's what the RMT advised. Their members... One, leave the EU to end a tax on rail workers. New EU rail policies, they said, are set to further entrench rail privatisation and fragmentation. That will also mean more attacks on jobs and conditions and EU laws will make it impossible to bring all of rail back into public ownership. Well, that's odd, because practically every country in the EU has state-owned railways. Two, leave the EU and end a tax on seafarers and offshore workers. <laughs> How's that going? Dreadful. Three, leave the EU to end a tax on workers' rights. Well, I refer you to the question that I just posed some moments ago. Leave the EU to stop the attack on our NHS. <laughs> and leave the EU to support democracy. Well, not if Vladimir Putin has got anything to do with it. Honestly, is there a document that has aged worse than this one? This is the actual RMT telling their members reasons why they should vote to leave the European Union. 
He says that RMT will be promoting the six key points direct to members across all sectors of the transport industry through the union's uh, uh, news and branches and reps and etc. and so on. RMT is proud to stand up for the tradition of progressive and socialist opposition to the European Union, an organisation wedded to privatisation, austerity and attacking democracy. The European Union, not the Conservative Party, privatisation, austerity and attacking democracy, they said vote with the Conservative Party against the EU. I mean, it could have been written by Jacob Rees-Mogg. What were they talking about? And so I thought, I wonder what other uh, organisations were uh, thinking about it at the time. And I looked up what the TUC were saying. And it's the absolute, total and complete opposite of what the RMC was, uh, uh, RMT was saying. The TUC released a paper in 2016 which, said, which was called UK Employment Rights and the EU. Assessment of the Impact of Membership of the European Union. It's... Um, couple of minutes long. Can you stand it? Since the mid-1970s, the European Union has played an important role in protecting working people from exploitation and combating discrimination, says the TUC. These EU rights have provided an important counterbalance against pressure for the UK to adopt a US-style hire and fire culture where there is an absence of statutory employment rights. Well, I'll just take a breather there for that to sink in. This was in uh, 2016. EU rights, an important counterbalance against the pressure for the UK to adopt a US-style hire and fire culture. Are we ringing any bells? It said the, e the EU has adopted a diverse range of treaty provisions and directives which provide important employment protections, has the EU done. They've safeguarded health and safety, promoted equality in the workplace. In some areas where the EU has legislated, the UK already had laws in place such as equal pay, maternity rights, sex, disability, race discrimination, and health and safety. Even so, EU action in these areas has improved and extended rights and now underpins them, making it more difficult for the UK government to undermine them unilaterally. Unless, of course, we're not in the European Union anymore. The TUC said, in other areas, the UK had to legislate for the first time in response to EU requirements. In some cases, laws that resulted directly from EU directives are now well accepted. For example, around sexual orientation, age, religion or belief discrimination. But other rights would have been difficult to, sec to secure in the UK and would still be particularly vulnerable to attack if the UK were to vote to leave the EU. For example... UK government strongly resisted equal treatments rights for agency workers, working time limits and rights for workers to receive information and be consulted on changes in their workplace that could affect their jobs or terms and conditions. Bells are ringing. As well as improving standards in EU member states, EU employment law has sought to create a level playing field so that workers' rights in one member state are not undermined by lower levels of protection in another in the absence of these safeguards, it's likely that the single market would have resulted in a race to the bottom, with countries seeking to compete against each other on the basis of lower pay and reduce employment protections for workers. That Singapore on Thames thing. Conclusion. The overall contribution of EU employment rights to the UK workforce is substantial. The gains UK workers achieve as a result of our membership of the EU include improved access to paid annual holidays, improved health and safety provision, rights to unpaid paternal leave, rights to time off work for urgent family reasons, equal treatment rights for part-time, fixed-term and agency workers, rights for outsourced workers, information and consultation and significant health and safety protection. Given these benefits, we conclude that EU membership con continues to deliver wide-ranging protections to UK workers. Furthermore, evidence also suggests that in the years ahead, Remaining in the European Union may provide significant opportunities to extend employment protections for working people. The same people who voted to leave the European Union. Because, look, a dinghy. 0345 6060 973. Text 84850. Email nick a at lbc.co.uk. And if you're on Twitter, it's at lbc. It's 11.30 on LBC, the news headlines.
with Serena Farrow. 0345 606 0973. Barry texts, I'm... Uh, hi, Nick, he says, I'm a traditional Tory supporter. If you can convince me that Diane Abbott, Mr Lammy and Emily Thornberry would be good custodians of our country, then I will eat my hat, says Barry. Barry, I'm not remotely interested in doing anything of the sort. And I um, couldn't care less whether you eat your hat or not. Continue to believe what the offshore billionaire press barons tell you to believe. And I hope you're very happy. Uh, let's have... Now, let's see who's been waiting the longest. I'll be totally fair about this. Hull. Hello, Charles. Oh, hi. Hi, Nick. Thanks for letting me on. Sure. I'll be very brief this time. Um, yes, yeah, see, uh, by Christmas this year, um, the United Kingdom people will be poorer. Yes. The entire nation not, will be no, poorer. Not, not the entire nation. One little yes. segment, and that's the members of Parliament. Correct. But most specifically, Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak. Do you know why? Ah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm on, I'm on, I'm hanging off my seat. On the edge of your, <laughs> on the edge of the precipice of expectation. Absolutely. The PM and the Chancellor have the lowest council tax in the country and will not face higher energy bills. Boris Johnson and oh. Rishi Sunak enjoy the lowest council tax charges in the country. The PM and the Chancellor pay the levy at their grace and favour residences, uh, number 11 and 10. But council tax in Westminster is the lowest in England. A banned <laughs> D property is liable. This is their full year's council tax, £827. What? Uh, what? Uh, yeah, a similar, uh, a similarly expensive... A property in uh, Nottingham, four thousand four hundred and fifty-one. Wow! Yeah, I mean the North. I mean, uh, you know, because holes part of the North. We speak as we find thou knows. But I mean, it's just going to be ridiculous by Christmas with all these energy prices. Yeah. But they, they also won't be suffering from that either, of course, because they are oh. liable for what is called a benefit in kind, which covers their heating and utilities at their flats in which they live rent-free. So <laughs> they'll be just <laughs> fine. Don't you worry about that, Charles. Oh, well, hey, we're all going to have a great time yeah, then. That's right. <laughs> We we could, it, I suppose, as a special dispensation, they might open the gates of Downing Street and allow us to peer through the window at their feasts. Yeah, so and, uh, and, and, and the platter and the turkey yeah. and and all the jelly, mm -hmm. the trifle. Oh, can you imagine? Bring your own bowl, Charles. And when they say, and when you say, please, sir, can I have some? Expect the answer. Where is it? No. There it is. And furthermore... No, 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 no. <sighs> I've, I haven't done this for such a while, I forget where some of these are. I'm reacquainting myself. Thanks a lot, Charles. Yeah, can you believe that? The very people that are visiting this upon us are not going to be um, suffering from it. And the reason, of course, why uh, the uh, uh, Westminster council tax is the lowest in England is because the government subsidises that council because it's their showpiece. They did the same with Wandsworth. I used to live in Wandsworth, and the council tax was, um, was so small it was virtually invisible to the naked eye. Tiny. That's because it was a showpiece council, and the government made sure to pour a boatload of money in there, and, uh, and then said, look, at this Conservative-led council, look how great they're doing. <laughs> Just because, because an enormous amount of everybody's money in the country went to prop up that council, yeah, to um, demonstrate uh, to the rest of the land uh, the munificence of a, a conservative lead, uh, leader of the council. The PM and the Chancellor pay the levy at their grace and favour residences, as in free. Council tax in Westminster is the lowest in, in England, a banned deep property liable for £827 a year. That's less than half the national average. I may have misspoken earlier. Both Downing Street apartments are in band H. Now, that uh, comes with a £1,655 bill. 
for council tax per year, £1,655. A same... The same band in Nottingham is not 1,655, it's 4,451. So the billionaire, Rishi Sunak, is paying 1,655. Someone in Nottingham is paying 4,451. I mean, it's just staggering, isn't it? I can't believe it. What a way to run a country, eh? Dreadful. Paul says, the government was shocked and surprised that P&O planned to sack their staff and then shocked and surprised that a couple of days later, uh, when... Hang on a minute, what? The government was shocked and surprised that P&O planned to sack all their staff, then shocked and surprised again a couple of days later when they did it as they forgot. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. How about this? It gets worse, everybody. Prepare yourself. Oh, no. Unions and the Labour Party have demanded immediate action over the sacking of 800 British crew uh, by uh, P&O ferries, including suspending the licences of the parent company, DP World. Well, they're not going to do that because they're uh, investing in free ports. Plus, uh, you know, it's, uh, they, uh, that, that's the place where all the oil comes from. And he was over there uh, just uh, the other day, crawling across the carpet on his hands and knees, begging for them to turn on the taps. And I do believe they said no. <laughs> the uh, Shadow Transport Secretary, Louise Hay, said, this was a despicable assault on workers, uh, but British seafarers do not need meaningless platitudes, they need action. She's written to the Prime Minister, oh, yo, that'll work, proposing that the government should claw back taxpayers' money, claimed by DP World, including £10 million in furlough payments. <laughs> Ten million quid we gave them to keep those people in work, and then they fired them anyway. I'll get to the good bit in a minute. The Defence Minister, James Heapy. You, you know James Heapy, the Defence Minister? No! Yeah, that's him. He said on Friday morning that it would be the right thing to do for P&O to hand back £10 million in furlough money, calling the company's behaviour disgraceful. Huh. Is that the same James Heapy that voted against the law to ban, fire and rehire? Yeah, I believe it is the, sa the very same one. Disgraceful. <laughs> Sources at the Department for Transport said it was made aware... Here, here it is. You ready? Sources at the Department for Transport said that it was made aware of the impending mass sackings and suspension of ferry services on Wednesday night. Boris Johnson's spokesperson said on Thursday, quotes, we weren't given any notice of this. What? Let that sink in for a moment. Is there any subject at any time that this Prime Minister has told the truth about? I'll make it really easy for you. Anything at all. They were told about it the night before it happened. When asked, they said, no, we were not told about it. He's a space hopper of Tourette's lying. It just pours out of him. The RMT Union's General Secretary, Mick Lynch, said the fact that the government knew the day before that a foreign-owned company planned to cause major disruption to UK ports but did nothing to prevent it is shocking. Uh, no, it isn't. <laughs> it's not surprising at all. You haven't been paying attention. Still, it's actually nice to talk about something other than the, uh, you know, the you-know-what. Even if it is this, 0345 6060 973, text 84850, email nick a at lbc.co.uk, and if you're on Twitter, it's at LBC. Mole texts, and another thing. The DP World London Gateway port is fully automated and employs very few actual people. Free ports are likely to be fully automated going forward, as DP World have already demonstrated in Thurrock. Oh, well, I'll just go to the foot of our stairs. That's our future. We're all going to get fired and replaced with robots. Affirmative. And I can't stand him. Tim emails, I think Boris needs to resign. As a Conservative voter, I think Kwesi Kwarteng is our best hope of winning the next election. <laughs> you can't really tell tone from uh, an email, but I assume you're joking. 
Funny, no? No. Neil tweets, the poor and conned vote Tory because they want to be like them, hoping that some of the toffs, accents and money will rub off on them. And when it doesn't, they can at least bask in their reflective glory. The, you know, there's something about, there's something, there's some truth to that. What they do is they, they sell you the fantasy of a, a, a better life, of making it, of becoming rich, with the notion that all we need to do to uh, release you to become enormously successful is to get rid of all of these dreadful laws that protect people like you. But the truth is, unless you were born rich, it is vanishingly unlikely that you will become rich. But it's the fantasy. It's what makes people buy a lottery ticket. It's the same as saying, you know what, you don't need to pay attention in school because Richard Branson. There'll always be an example, but the example does not reflect reality for 99.99 recurring percent of the population. Uh, Stevenage, hello, VJ. Hi, Nick. Couple of things. Uh, good show. Uh, first of all, does Britain own owe Iran the interest on the 400 million they kept had for four, 40 years? Yeah, um, I don't know whether we were paying it all the time. Um, I've got absolutely no idea, but yes, we do, of course. Yeah, and it'd probably be all the money that that we're spending on um, this this uh, train line to to the north and so on. Oh, so easily. That's pretty, easily. I mean, and I don't know. I don't know what because it'd be compound interest, of course. I, so I don't know what the yeah. interest on four hundred million few, pounds from nineteen seventy nine is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's quite a few billion. Uh, but but the whole uh, deal has been kept hush hush, and apparently mm. they can't reveal it to the public what yeah. it is. Oh, apparently sure. there's a right. And second one is: Have you ever thought about applying as a presenter for Question Time on the BBC? Because you would be very good. <laughs> no, I wouldn't. Because their, their ratings have gone right down to they... hardly anything. It, 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 at the moment, it's very rubbish. But I think you would do a great job. I you would do apply. a terrible job. I'll leave it no. to the experts. No, you are the expert. No, I'm absolutely. You are. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. But thanks very much, VJ. Yeah, I'll, your breath of fresh air. I'll Thank you. Pass your suggestion on to uh, somebody who could actually do a good job, like James O'Brien or Nick Ferrari, for instance. Thanks, VJ. O three four five six zero six zero nine seven three. Gaz tweets. Nick, it's prejudice, prejudice, fear of the other side. It's as simple as that, and they play it every time, predominantly in the Murdoch right-wing press. We need to start a debate on whether to have politics on the national curriculum. I think that time has come. Oh, God, can you, you imagine how uh, much of a, uh, a, a twisted mess the Conservatives would uh, tie themselves into trying to police what, peop what kids are taught under uh, politics in school? They'd make it illegal to, to even mention the Labour Party under threat of a thrashing. Ten years imprisonment for causing a, for causing a disturbance. <laughs> Clapham, hello, Anna. Hello. Oh, is that Nick Abbott? Is that Anna? Yes, I. you know, you are my hot date on Friday. Wow. Do you know that? I don't. Well, I do now. Well, yes, I have spoken to you before. The thing is, I wanted to talk to you about something serious, but you've had me and my friends here giggling so much. Stop giggling. <laughs> <laughs> but I, but I'm, I'm finding it rather difficult now to talk about a serious matter. Well, now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Is the radio on in the background? Because I hear a mumbling. Yes. Oh, yeah, Alexa, stop. <laughs> yes. Alexa, shut yeah. up. That's exactly right. Alexa, just stop. Stop yeah, it right yeah. now. Alexa, stop. Oh, she's very contrary, you know. She, she is now. getting some attitude. Oh, she certainly is. She doesn't behave. Have, have you... Um, it was my eldest son who introduced me to Alexa. He said, Mummy, you've got to have Alexa because yeah. she'll do everything. Turn your lights on. Oh, I mm -hmm. don't know how that works. But she does play music. And I, uh, uh, 
you know. But the unfortunate thing is... What kind of music do you get, uh, Alexa, to well, play? Well, you know, when I've spoken to you before, we, we share something in common, Dr. Yeah. John. Dr. John, it, right. Right place, wrong yeah. time. Right place, wrong yeah. time. Absolutely. And, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and so she is able... My son bought me this Alexa thing and said, you can ask for Dr. John or whoever yeah. when you want. Right. I'm, I'm not getting to grips with her because she's rather contrary... Play music in the Dr. John manner, and there'll be all sorts of Zydeco and uh, Narlins yes, music and so all of that good stuff. Other things. Of course. And, and also, you have you and I have one other thing in common that what? we discussed, which was uh, the, the 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 movie. Uh, Oh, uh, oh, see, I'm losing my brain. Koya um, No, 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 no. A movie that was supposed to be a comedy. Oh, oh, that oh. That was about um, uh, yeah. degeneration, uh, evolution. Idiocracy. You know? Idiocracy, that's it. We've already discussed that. Well, there's a, there's a newer one. There's a, well, there's a new um, thing on that um, plane, on that... Uh, in that genre. Exactly. Thank you so much. I, well, I was getting stuck on, on that tip, and I didn't want to use that phrase because that sounds like a DJ. Hey! Uh, a new genre. Yeah. Okay. On, in the same, me, what is it? In is it? the same genre. It's a, it's a brand new film, and it's very, very, very good. It's called, it's called what? Don't Look Up. Oh, I've seen that. Oh, oh. Wasn't that brilliant? It was very good. In fact, I want yeah. to see it again. So do I. I, I well, I, I want to see it more. Days ago. <laughs> so, <laughs> so no. Yeah. Um, yeah, but so what but was it you called the about there, is, Anna? I, I was actually calling up about something quite serious. Because yes. um, uh -oh. Uh -oh. you're the only person that, you know, uh, takes my calls. Mm. Uh, when, you know, uh, uh, so we've gone through all that. And I was going to say there's all this business about um, uh, accepting Ukrainians into our hips. Yeah. But we haven't thought about Russians. Now, I have just, uh, 10 days ago, uh, uh, got a Russian here. Mm. No, well, I, I'm not going to say her name, and you don't know my surname, and so all of that's fine. No. Where did you find no her? Pass what? Where did you find her? I can't, I'm not going to tell you all that because that would compromise her. Okay. Because there are Russians now who are leaving. Yeah, that's right. They're scared out well, of their with wits. Good, with good reason. Well, precisely. So, you see, I don't think we're taking the whole, you see, so this is a bit serious, but I find it difficult. Now, to be serious, because I've been giggling so much. Well, I think that it's, it's getting to the point that we're, we're going to have to start a new country. We're going to have to build a country out in the middle of the sea somewhere for people who don't want to live in Russia and, they, and they're fleeing from Ukraine. And, and pretty soon, what with it's uh, going to be illegal to uh, say bad things about the regime in this country, people are going to be leaving here as well. Well, that's a point. I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. So what do you think, because I have always admired you, I've been listening to you for years, because you are uh, do you know, I have actually cancelled dinner parties to listen to you. <laughs> you know that you can listen back on as a podcast you don't actually have to listen to it live No, I'm not smart enough to know right. how to use podcasts. All you have I, to you do know, I'm a woman of a certain age Anna, darling. you already have the tools at your disposal she's um, a, a little thing with a light on the top a bit, whose name begins with A. You can't say it out loud because you'll burst into life no, I really, I, I really am a computer numpty. I don't know how to use the podcast. You I don't know how to use just, anything like just that. Just ask Alexa. Oh, can I ask Alexa? Can I ask Alexa to play Nick Abbott? She will do oh, anything she, you want. She, have you heard her? See. She's just started up. Alexa, shut up. <laughs> Alexa, shut up. Up. Shut up, Alexa. Seriously. Yeah. You know, yeah. she said, you're up. right. Mm. I asked her to play you, and she started playing you. Playing me. There you go, you see. Perfect. Isn't that amazing? I am stunned. But what do you think about the point? Oh, please. I. Oh, and do you know who I miss on your show? That the girl who calls in, who has a really a high little voice like that, and she always starts talking to you about nonsense. Yeah. And then that she sounds gets... like sounds like this show. 
No, and then she gets down to something really serious. Right. Well, I've got absolutely no idea. You, you, you no, describe fifty percent of the people. Much. While I'm, I'm, there's no must about it, Anna. What do you mean? There's no must. You no, just you said you must who know. Rings you regularly. Yeah, yeah, I know. You just described her in, in detail, and I've got absolutely. I don't listen to this show, Anna. Seriously, uh, I, would I waste my time listening to this show? The host is an idiot. No, but when no, but when you talk to her, you obviously know her. Right. Well, I don't. Um, I don't know anybody that calls to this. Uh, that calls in uh, this this show. I I wipe my mind clean. The moment this show ends, believe me, I remember nothing. And then what do you do? Do you just have a, a laugh with your motor car? Because I'm very interested in your motor car. Uh, well, one is, it's more like um, a sort of a sculpture in that it doesn't actually work as a car. It just <laughs> sits under a plastic bag in the driveway, does nothing. It's useless. And uh, the other, when the last two days, it has been um, a, a, a sand receptacle. I think half of the Sahara blew over this country. Every single car in the land is absolutely filthy. But anyway, Anna, it's been a delight. 0345 6060 973. Text 84850. Email nick a at lbc.co.uk. And if you're on Twitter, it's at LBC. Yeah, that podcast that I did with Carol McGiffin, by the way. It's called What's Your Problem with Nick and Carol. Oh, right, yeah. In which Carol McGiffin and I try to solve people's problems while laughing like drains. Ask for it by name on an internet near you. What's your problem with Nick and Carol? I think you'll find it a laugh. <laughs> I am not one of your fans! I was just trying to look up the, um, the, the state of... The company that owns P and O, because you know people are saying, "Oh, well, they ain't got no." I know I'm a bit off mic at the moment. I'm going going through my papers. Very important papers. It comes and it comes. Wait a minute. Absolutely fabulous that was, by the way. One moment, please. God, I've got so much stuff. I've got so much bump. <laughs> That's what it's called. I can't find it, so I'll just make it up. They made, uh, I think the turnover was over a billion pounds a year. What? And they made, um, I can't remember how many hundreds of millions, but I think they passed on to their shareholders and, uh, you know, uh, rewarded the bosses for excellence in uh, every regard, something in the order of 200 million pounds in one year. Doesn't sound like they're doing badly. I mean, one part of the company might not have been doing very well. But I suppose that that was all the fault of the workers and nothing to do with the management. <sighs> Why is it always the workers that have to pay for the, um, the, the poor running of a company? You know, like the governor of the Bank of England just the other day he said, oh, well, we can't have people, uh, you know, asking for more money for, uh, you know, to uh, try and uh, make their way through life. We can't have uh, wage, wages spiralling upwards because that would be disastrous for the economy. Well, here's a uh, novel idea. How about companies just to make do with making less profits? Uh, is, is that uh, possible in any way, shape or form? No. No, of course not. Companies must continue making their profits. It's the workers that have got to suffer. And the workers keep voting for the party that makes this uh, happen over and over and over again. But, you know, they, they knew what they were voting for, as I've been told about a million times. Thornton Heath. Hello, Noel. <coughs> no. Yeah, so I'll just turn, turn the radio down, yeah. <coughs> I'll keep do, you, it, uh... do you have a persistent cough? Uh, no, no, not really, no. <laughs> OK. <laughs> All right, it's, then. I, I think it's a habit, you know? Right. OK, okay Nick, uh, do you remember you, you mentioned earlier that um, how could one got, one person be holding uh, a gun to six billion people's head? Yes. I think that was it. But it's, 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 it's more than one person. Um, the, the, the problem started um, at, uh, at the Arab Spring when the, the failure of the Obama administration to um, control ISIS. Oh, and, it's, um, it's, it's Barack Obama's fault. I had no, no idea. He, he, no, he, he, he did a lot of good. But um, the, then comes along the Russians, okay, um, destroyed ISIS. So, so they had a lot of support in America. 
had a, a lot of support over here. Um, and uh, uh, the thing comes along Donald Trump, which was um, a savior uh, for, for, for Putin. D- do you remember um, when he was uh, um, in- inaugurated, um, uh, Putin uh, phoned him and said, um, congratulations, Your Excellency. <laughs> do you remember that? You didn't no, hear that, huh? I don't remember anything of the sort, no. But so supposing um, I phoned... Yeah, that's what he did. He said that, yeah. Supposing I phoned you and uh, I said, hello, Nick, and then... You replied, hello, no, Your Excellency. Yeah. You wouldn't do that, would you? Uh, it was because, unlikely. Um, you, you put a, a, um, a person on a higher plane than yourself. But he, he only did that in order to, um, because he, know, he knows that Trump has got, has got low mentality, um, to get Trump on his side, you see. Okay, um, well, within the, the first six months of Trump's um, uh, presidency, he invited uh, the Russians over. Um, and after about 40 minutes, he, he kicked out all the Americans. Um, and who was to say what happened in that meeting? Yeah, we've got absolutely no idea. Th- uh, that that so part... I, I, personally, I personally believe uh, that they, they opened a case and injected Trump with nanoprobes. <laughs> well, well, that, 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 or, that or, makes or a control perfect drug. sense, yes. And um, do you remember you had Simon Marks on uh, about two weeks ago? Can we talk, about, said, can we talk about the nanoprobes? So... We, so <laughs> Donald Trump's got nano Russian nanoprobes coursing through his veins in order to uh, keep him in control. It has gotten totally out of control. Is that what you're saying? Exactly. Right. Exactly. Or a control drug. Um, do you remember Tom Mark said that um, two weeks ago that um, the majority of the Republican Party are pro-Russian? Or was it a Russian apologist or something? Um and who's to say that um, he, he did not take that case and, it, and, and the uh, nano, administer to them? Nano, nano probes, right. Yeah. Okay, well, we, you're, you're making a lot of sense, uh, Noel. Bing bong. By which I mean none at all. Thanks a lot, mate. 0345 6060973. Does anybody have any idea what that meant? No. But it was educational. <laughs> Stuff you learn on this show, eh? Joe Tex, Nick, in 1979, Thatcher made it, I cannot say that name without, um, you know, spitting it out like that. Because I went, I was at uh, university in 1979. And I have to tell you that everybody I went to university with uh, said her name in the exact same way. Margaret Thatcher. Nick, in 1979, says Joe, Thatcher made it her number one priority to smash workers' defence organisations, as in trade unions, associations and collectives, and that's why P&O are able to do what they've done today. Thanks a lot, Maggie. Daryl says, automation is a good thing. Affirmative. It could give everyone more leisure time. (laughs) Yeah, right. But we would need universal basic income to supplement it, says Daryl. Well, think of all the things that were sold to us as uh, increasing our leisure time. Like um, steam irons. So let's go way back to the 1950s, shall we? Steam irons and washing machines. People used to have to go down to the river and beat their clothes on rocks. So imagine how much free time you'd have if you had an automatic um, rock-beating machine to wash your clothes in your kitchenette. God, wouldn't that be marvellous? And then um, uh, vacuum cleaners so you didn't have to hoover and uh, we can fast forward to computers. Well, now we've all got a computer in our house. Haven't we all freed up our time? No. Of course not. We're working more hours than ever before. People are working from the moment they wake up. They reach over and they pick up their phone to see their work emails. And they look at their work emails over their breakfast. And then they go down to the bus or the train, whatever it might be, and they're looking at their work emails and they're doing their work on the way into work. So they don't start at 9 and finish at 5 anymore because the same process uh, is um, repeated on the way home. So you're working from about 7 in the morning to 7 at night because of all of these labour-saving devices which aren't anything of the sort. So don't believe it for a second. We may have... um, And I think what perhaps he means by leisure time is we'll all get fired... 
universal basic income uh, would be a good idea if we had a, a, a regime that was remotely interested in the uh, in uh, you know in the um, welfare of its uh, people. But if the people will continue to vote for a party that doesn't that is not remotely interested in their welfare, then I guess everybody deserves what they get. Uh. Gina tweets, you hit it on the nail, Nick. It's these blooming dinghies. <coughs> Same folk that voted Brexit because of all those blooming immigrants coming over here and taking our jobs, uh, the jobs that are mysteriously now vacant. Yeah, that is a good point. If only somebody had said something before we voted. But I didn't hear a single solitary person who said that it might be a bad idea to leave the European Union. Not one person... Uh, dereliction of duty. Stockwell. Hello, Seb. Oh, hi there, Nick. Seb. Hello. Yes, Seb. Hi. Um, <laughs> completely agree with your Hello. latest bits about um, the computers at home and things like that. It's definitely not saving anyone any time. No. And we are all stressed. Everyone is. Everybody I mean, is stressed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but definitely what most people are doing is not having that one-to-one -one relationship that they used to have with the person sat across the, the way from them. Nobody is remotely them. interested in speaking to the person that they're with. They're too mm. busy looking at their phone, typing yeah. messages to somebody they aren't with. Yeah, it's very sad. And uh, I've lost quite a lot of friends to it, and I'm sure, I'm sure everyone else has as well. It's just really... Yes, I'm sure it wasn't intended to be like that, but that's how it's ended up, hasn't it? It's it's odd though that the internet is actually the the best and the worst of almost anything you yeah. can think of. But I, I guess it's just the extremes of what human beings are like. <laughs> yes, probably. I mean, yeah. it's, it's the best tool of information that has ever been invented, mm. but it is also the best tool of misinformation that has ever been invented. Yeah. It's the best tool of freedom, but it's also the best t uh, tool of control and um, an observation. Not observation of, of um, what is it when um, an evil organisation is peering at you all the time? What's that word? Um, surveillance. Surveillance, by... that'll do. We'll go with that one. Yeah. It's the best tool of surveillance that has ever been invented. What yeah. your phone does not know about you is mm -hmm. uh, not worth printing. It knows more about you than you do. Oh, yeah, definitely. Most definitely. So, uh, I was calling, actually, and it's a kind of... Um, you asked the question, why do people that don't earn much money or have much money vote Conservative? Mm. And I thought, oh, I know that, the answer to that. Oh. And because I've not got any money, <laughs> and <laughs> I did vote Conservative. I did also vote for Remain with Brexit. Remain? Yes. A Ramona? Stop whining. But it was it was a fifty fifty, and I, it was almost I had to flip a coin on the day of voting. Right. So I've gone. Where's he gone? <laughs> he just cut himself off. Phones should actually come with instructions. He's probably put himself on mute. He thinks he thinks I can still hear him because <laughs> he's still oh, there sorry, on the yes, There mute. you are. It's my earlobe. It just oh. keeps doing it again. Another piece. And he's just done it again. That's not working. Your earlobe is cutting you off. Uh, it, it presses the mute button. <laughs> Can you believe it? I know. Well, yeah. Put us on, um, uh, this one time only, put us on speakerphone. Yeah, you're on. How can your earlobe put, put it on mute? Doesn't your screen di um, go black when you put it to your head? Well, to I, it's, uh, it, my ears at the side of my head, so I can't see what the screen's doing. Well, that is a, that's a very good point. He's, he's one of those people whose ears are at the side of his head. Yes. No. Amazing. You want to get one of these newfangled phones? Seriously, my my screen shuts off when you put it to your head, and for to stop oh, right. that very thing. Uh, how, well, how old is your phone? Uh, it, well. I don't know, four years old? Well, then it should have that facility. Maybe you've accidentally switched yeah. it off with your earlobe. Maybe I have, yeah. I'll have to look at my updates. I'm sure I'm up to date. But, yes, it's a slightly older phone than right. most people have now, but it's a high up number. OK. <laughs> <laughs> Without telling you what it is. Right. Um, so, the going back to the original, 
Uh, so why do people vote Conservative? Well, because the other side causes even more problems. Do they? In what <laughs> yeah. sense? In, so, OK, so when I... When Labour was in, my council tax doubled in five years. My um, the tax that I paid for my income uh, threshold didn't go up for was it six years, nine years? Um, that doesn't whereas, sound right. Yeah, the Gordon Brown didn't put it up for six years, and then I think there was a three years before that. So the tax threshold, so more more of our more of my money was just going into tax. Uh, mm. uh, you know, and at the lower end. And actually, what the Conservatives did with the Coalition was, you know, really lift that quite high. Yes, from Seb. 6,000 to 12. Right, but... The, now, the, I know the, that's now stalled again. Right, but it, OK. Well, well, let me tell you why that is a, a, a false argument. Because mm -hmm. tax cuts overwhelmingly benefit the rich. If you mm. earn £20,000... Uh, let's make it really simple. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Never mind about the tax-free amount at the beginning. So if you earn 20 grand and the tax is at 10%, then you pay two grand in tax. Yeah. If they reduce it by 1%, then you save 200 quid. If you are poor mm -hmm. enough to earn 20 grand a year. If you earn mm -hmm. 2 million pounds a year, then you will have saved 2,000 mm pounds. -hmm. No, wait, 20,000 uh, pounds. Yeah. So tax cuts always benefit the rich. And then, of course, it's what they spend the tax on, which also benefits the poor. It's on welfare and care and the NHS and the police and the safety net for those balancing on the line of poverty and the majority of us who are just about getting by, which is what the, the countries with the happiest people do. They charge a bit more in tax and then they spend yeah. it on creating a happier people. It's this false argument that the Tories push, that the right wing always push, that if we reduce your tax, you'll be happier. But it's the opposite of that, because the vast chunk of the money that is freed up goes to those who are already rich and those that, that are poorer, who rely on the state for all of the things I've just mentioned, the safety net, they get nothing because they have to cut that in order to feed the tax cuts for the rich. But it makes you feel as though you're getting more money. But then curiously, after a while, you think, well... Yeah, but everything's worse, and I'm less happy. So whose fault's that, then? Tax cuts only benefit the rich. It's a false economy for those who have got little to vote for the party that is the party of the tax cuts. Uh, but thanks, Seb. 0345 6060 973. Thank you for holding your call is important to us. This important call in Morden is from a person called Shirley. Shirley. Yes. How are you? Okay. Okay, I'm just going back a few hours ago. Yes. Uh, some, of, some of the things you said. A couple of three hours um, ago. <laughs> yeah. Um, I want to know why you constantly criticise the Conservative Party. You want to know why I constantly criticise the Conservative Party? Mm. Why I'm a big meanie? <laughs> yeah. Well, let's see. They've been in power for the last 12 years. They've been in power for two-thirds of the time since the Second World War. So literally everything that is wrong with this country is their fault. So there's that. Really? Yes. Well, I'm Charles the 60s. Charles of the 60s? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I grew up in the 70s. Yeah. And I remember the lights going out. Mm -hmm. And we had no nothing. Right. And I remember when I turned 18 and Mrs. Thatcher was in power. Yeah. I know you don't like that. No. And I got a chance to vote. I lived my life in the 70s and it was terrible. Well, I lived my life in the 70s and it was... Yeah. It was... Uh... You didn't really realise how grubby and awful things were in the 70s until you look at a TV programme that was made in the 70s now. And, and it looks like, it look, kind of looks like, um, but not like Ukraine exactly, but it looks like a war zone. I mean, there's just rubble yeah. everywhere and everything yeah. didn't work and it was just rubbish, yeah. But that was the yeah. case in America anyway. and in, uh, in, every anyway. other, in every other country on Earth. That wasn't yeah. just Britain. Anyway, I got a chance to buy my own property. Yeah. 
so, then in the so, 90s... So you're all right, Jack? Is that what you're saying? No. I, I got a chance to buy my own property. And then in the 90s, mm. I went through Blair, and we went through where I couldn't even eat, nor could my kids, and I lived on credit cards. So that was Tony Blair's fault? Yes. How, how so? Because... Let me put it back to the future now. Back to the future. I'm better now, but in every Labour Party, I've suffered. Right. <laughs> with, with the Conservative Party, I've never... You've never suffered under a Conservative administration? No. Right. <laughs> OK. Duly noted. Thanks a lot, Shirley. I mean, I could argue about that, but really, what's the point? Um, Gina tweets, you hit the nail on the head, Nick. It, have I read this one? Oh, yeah, I have. It's the blooming dinghies. I lived through the 1970s. And um, for Tory voters they uh, and politicians... Still, even now, after 12 years of Conservative rule, they are still blaming everything that ails this nation on the Labour Party. It's incredible. It, right, right up to the very top. Even uh, his imperial bodginess himself. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wait, 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 wait. Anytime uh, anything is wrong, oh, well, it's, uh, it's all Jeremy Corbyn's fault. Or under the last uh, Labour administration... If only uh, they had ruled 100% of the time since the year dot, then uh, maybe they wouldn't be blaming Labour all the time. It's incredible. <laughs> and buying a house when houses were so cheap they were giving them away with 10 gallons of petrol is not necessarily... It has anything to do with the, with the Conservative Party, apart from the fact that they sold council houses off on the cheap. Two people, such as that person that I was just uh, speaking to, and the result of that is that, of course, uh, every young person under the age of 50 in this country now hasn't got a hope of ever getting on the uh, property ladder because, like I said before, I'm all right, Jack. Which is partly why old people continue to vote for the Conservative Party because uh, I'm all right, Jack. And to hell with anybody else. What does blow my mind is that poor people continue to vote for the Conservative Party. I mean, you, you can understand why rich pensioners would. And the, uh, the vast majority of the wealth that has been created since the uh, economic crash of 2007 has gone to those over the age of, I think, over the age of 60. The, the already haves, in other words. The haves and the have yachts. Everybody else has got nothing. And the result of that is that property prices have just gone skyrocketing, up and up and up and up, till uh, it's absolutely impossible for anybody young, like that person I was just talking to, when she got her house, nobody that age can get their house now, unless, uh, you know, it's the uh, bank of mum and dad. And mum and dad happen to be rich. But, you know, sure, yeah, it's Jeremy Corbyn's fault. Yeah, no doubt. Ian says, I always thought earlobes had no function. How wrong was I? Uh, Incorrect, Ian. It's to mute your phone, obviously. It's what God intended. Oh, I missed it. Oh, that would have been... Uh, never mind. A God noise would have ensued, but uh, the, it's the moment's gone. Uh, Yorkshire. Hello, Mike. Hi, Nick, yeah. Um, can we talk about refugees a bit? Oh, oh all right then. Um, you have a debate about our national refugee policy. Was it incompetence or policy? Yeah. Well, I was listening to a girl today um, speaking from Poland, and her family had put ourselves on the list for um, taking refugees. And this is a parent's house. This girl was in her 20s. And to coordinate it, she went over to Poland to meet some refugees and facilitate them coming to stay with her mum and dad. Right. And it took her five hours to process the first one of a family of four to be able to come to UK because the refugees had to answer so many questions about their sponsor in UK yeah. that she said she spent most of the five hours on the phone to England 
with the parents going through their filing cabinet to explain what mortgage they'd got um, and details such as that that the refugees had to provide before they could hook up with their English sponsor. I'm amazed that they allowed that plane that was uh, that was flying in uh, Nazanin Zagari Ratcliffe to land without her providing her last three electricity bills. Yeah, I mean, it, it seems a, it seems like a policy that they've made it as difficult as possible of for course. these refugees. It's not like a policy that's made it as difficult as possible. It is the policy that's made it, that's making it as difficult as possible. That's because that is their unique selling point. The Tories are in power because of their enmity towards foreigners. That's their thing. Why would they change that? Because that's what their fans like. This thing that's happened has just taken them by surprise because even their fans are repulsed by their attitude now. And so that's why it's taken them... Uh, they, they, uh, the Tory party just stood there with their mouths up and going, well, hang on a minute, you, you voted for us because we hate foreigners. You, you, you like them now? And then, and I think the reason why it's this hi, hi, hiving off the responsibility onto us rather than they do something about it, and I think, and I, I have said this on the air before, I, I think that it was, uh, oh, yeah, oh, all right, then you like um, refugees so much, you put one up in your house, and that's where we are. Yeah, I mean, you can look at, you can regard Pretty Patel as incompetent. I mean, but go. No, I don't think so. I I don't think it's incompetence. I don't think they're errors. I think this is the plan. It's working really well. It's not working badly. It's working really well. Yeah, but if you look at Gove, I mean, he might be a twisted little (laughs) disco dancer. But he's not, he's not stupid. So it has to be a policy. It definitely cannot be incompetence on that one. Is there any doubt? Not at all. But anyway, second point, last point, quickly. Boris Johnson goes over to Saudi, mm. right? Yeah. Now, who the Saudis and the Iranians are daggers drawn. They hate each other. Yes. So why would you go over to Saudi the day after you've paid the Iranians 400 million quid and then ask for a favour off them? It's utterly insane. The timing was so ridiculous. I mean, he just got cold shouldered over there. You could see it on all the interviews and everything else. Yeah, he went, he went there and got nothing. Yeah, all right, Mike, I've got to go. Thanks, mate. 0345 6060 973. It's just past 12.30. The news headlines with Serena Farrow. Are you trying to tell me that this is your act? Sadly, yes. Anthony texts, Nick, please remind Mrs. I'm All Right Jack that she got her opportunity to buy Council House at a massive discount funded by other taxpayers. If only we'd all been so lucky, eh? Uh, Jim says, the power cuts of the early 1970s happened halfway through the 1970 to 74 Conservative government. That's right. Yeah. (laughs) They they even do that today. Uh, Tory politicians even do that today. They blame Labour for something that happened when they were in power. Assuming, probably, that people won't check or won't remember the dates. The three-day week was 1973 to 74, when Ted Heath was in power. You know, all all the nice boys like a sailor. That bloke. Ted Heath, the Conservative Prime Minister. Um, I I could uh, give you a little history lesson. I could uh, read that out, but you can uh, look it up yourself. History. Boring! Keith says, I had a colonoscopy when Blair was Prime Minister and it was awful. I voted Conservative and I haven't had one since. <laughs> Life is comfortable, says Keith. A little bit too much information there, Keith. Disgusting. 0345 6060 uh, Manchester. Hello, Daniel. Hi. Hi, Nick. How you doing? Good, thanks. Um... <laughs> I want to bring it back, to be fair, because uh, one, one of your earlier colleagues, uh, call, sorry, said, oh, I vote Conservative, essentially because it fits their lifestyle. And as someone, I'm only 27, quite young, you know, from the North, it, it all seems a selfish point of view every single time. Every time we talk to a Conservative voter, it's because it meets their ends more than it, I suppose, meets the, the, the collective. And I think this, this community sense no longer exists. 
Yeah, well, that that seems indisputable. Yeah, it's it is the I'm all right, Jack party. But but what is weird is that those who have nothing vote the most for the Conservative Party. That that's the demographic that they rely on the most. Those who have nothing. Yeah, uh, yeah which which I which I agree. But I, I think maybe it's it's the pressure of, I suppose. The, you know, the, the I'm all right jacks have been voting I'm all right for so long and have such an influence over, you know, the people who don't understand if they're all right or not all right, that they're being influenced too easily to think that perhaps we'll be all right if we listen to the people who, pretend, you know, theoretically are. And there needs a real step in to go, actually, these people aren't your friends. They do not have your, your best interests in heart. And they need a real education. You get things like double down news and what whatnot. We, you know, we seem too extremist for people to actually subscribe to, and then people still subscribe to, I suppose, everyday media without actually wanting to go a bit beyond that. And without really understanding that every day the papers are almost all owned by offshore foreign billionaires whose interests with the poor do not coincide. They're not on your side, people. Would you would you say though that they're not on your side because they're not they're not British owned, or would you say they're not on your side because they're they're, they're off they're offshore owned? Because no. I I would say it doesn't matter if they're offshore or not. If they're owned by billionaires, those billionaires do not know what it's like to live in a red brick council estate. It's not so, that, it's not that they don't know. It's that their interests are opposing. Billion, billion, millionaires and billionaires, the, the number one thing that is most important to them, it, it seems to me, is paying less tax. Tax, if you're a millionaire or upwards, is for the benefit of the little people. They, they're not remotely interested in the NHS. They're never going to use it. They go straight to private uh, medicine. They're not really bothered uh, about the police. They live behind walls. They have their own security patrols. They're not interested in a welfare safety net. They'll never need it. All of this stuff that bleeds out of their bank accounts is going to help people not like them. That's why they're so obsessed with paying they're less tax. They're interested in tax rebates, though, aren't they? Well, that's what, that, that accounts to paying less tax. Well, that's just, yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't know. I mean, like I say, I'm, I'm only younger. I've only been on the planet for not a very long time. <laughs> well, getting, getting, getting miserable with it as it stands. Well, yeah, it's, uh, the, the planet's not going through a great phase at the moment, uh, Daniel, but I'm sure it'll get better in the end. You know, unless, um, unless, <laughs> unless the actual end comes before that. But best of luck with it, Daniel. Thanks a lot, mate. See, when you... Um, if you, say, earn £2 million a year... And the tax is at 10%. Now, that uh, 10% tax, that sounds great, doesn't it? Oh God, if only tax was 10%, wouldn't that be marvellous? But if you earn £2 million a year, if you get 10% tax, that's £200,000 you're going to have to give up. That's massive. Even if it's 10%, it's not the percentage, it's the amount the percentage is levied on. That's the thing. I mean, if tax was 10% as a flat rate and you earned 20 grand, then that's just 2,000 a year. 2,000 is a small amount of money. I mean, it would mean a lot to somebody who was on 20 grand, but it's still a small amount, 2,000. But 200,000? That's massive. So no wonder they want to reduce the amount of tax they see, because 200 grand, blimey, that's a, uh, that's a Lamborghini, that is. Nobody wants to write that check. Doesn't matter how much you earn, uh, because apparently uh, no amount is ever enough. I mean, why would a billionaire get up at five o'clock in the morning to go to work, to stare at a screen and move numbers about, or whatever it is they do for a living? Because too much is never enough. <sighs> 0345 Brian text Nick, Nye Bevin, classic quote, how can wealth persuade poverty to use its political power to keep wealth in power. Here lies the whole art of conservative politics in the 20th century. Works just as well in the 21st century. You know, there's a, there's a classic cartoon that I see every now and again, and it's three people sitting around a desk. Uh, one of them is um, a, uh, a, a worker in a hard hat. One of them is uh, an, obviously a, uh, a refugee of some sort, like a foreigner. 
and one of them, just for the purposes of this cartoon, is Rupert Murdoch. And before each one of them, there's a plate with, um, which is, which has got biscuits on it. Now, <laughs> the worker has got two biscuits on his plate. The refugee has no biscuits, and Rupert Murdoch's plate is so full of biscuits that it's spilling out over the table. And the legend underneath is Rupert Murdoch saying to the guy in the hard hat, he says, watch out, mate, that bloke's after your biscuits. And there it is in a nutshell. Dinghy spotting. Uh, let's have um, Ealing. Hello, John. Hello. John. Hey, I tell you what, you know, I'm, it amazes me. You know, you spoke to um, one of your callers, and I, I, I don't criticise callers because obviously everyone deserves an opinion, whatever, they, to carry on. But the idea, right, that, you know, Thatcher is this kind of paragon of virtues. When you think about it, we're beholden to uh, Russia, to China, to Saudi Arabia, and France and whomever, because mm. we sold all of our assets. Off. Correct. Yes, for a we short for a short term profit for people for, for a vanishingly few number of people. We didn't get any anything from it. Yes, and and that's it. And now we're being held ransom by them. This is why Putin thinks he can do what he wants. This is why even China and Saudi Arabia, he, but you know, Boris will go and do a deal, and they'll laugh in his face because. Yeah. They know we're so dependent. It's like we're junkies. You know, like dependent on a, some, a source of some kind of narcotic. And the thing is, what amazes me is Boris Johnson will come out with a statement like that. Um, and the bottom line is, then he goes cap in hand to Saudi Arabia. What we changed from uh, under Thatcher was a country that made stuff, you know, like, like, like Germany is now, to a mm -hmm. country that moves numbers around on a screen for, mm -hmm. so we come to find out, for the, for, uh, for the benefit of the international criminal super rich who come here for us to launder their cash clean. The result, I've met these people. The result Nicholas, of which... I've worked. The result of which of is bringing in all of this money means that us poor dopes who pay taxes now can't really afford to live here anymore. No, of course. And the thing is, I never thought I was going to get words of wisdom from the Terminator, but he was. He, but he's bang on. Yeah, what he said. What, what did he say? Oh, uh, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. He was just. He was more or less saying along the lines of, you know, this is this this idea that they're trying to denazify. Oh, that yeah. Um, you know, and uh, he was he was doing parallels about. It. I think his father was a was a Nazi. I mean that's not a good opening gambit that <laughs> that bit, but 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 no. But he was he was he's actually he made a lot of sense what he said. And, you know, apparently a lot of people are actually downloading what he said. I think it's um, up to like twenty five million um, views at the moment. Yeah, something like that. Last time I looked, so it's probably way over that now. Yeah, it, that, yeah. that Arnold Schwarzenegger is like direct to Vladimir Putin, basically, or or the or the Russian people essentially. And um, yeah, I thought it was pretty They're good being speech. Sold a load of rhubarb. Yeah. Could I also say, Nick, um, when I hear Boris Johnson talk a load of rhubarb and then I hear um, Jacob Rees-Mogg say things along the line of, oh, well, this is just, uh, it's just fluff. <laughs> it's just a load of fluff. Yeah. People died. I have people I know that have died. I'm sure everyone does that is listening to this thing. And this isn't, the problem is with the elderly, you see, this is the thing with them. If they confuse patriotism with voting they think they think if they vote conservative they're somehow being patriotic the point is though boris johnson is kind of a russian stooge and so is so is uh you know donald trump you know if you think about it we, we, you know we're a, we're a bloody we're a joke across the whole of the world because we just go cap in hand from one disaster to another i just wonder where this is going to go because what as as we we're just saying what we do for a living now is to launder the ill-gotten gains of the international criminal super rich who now we are being forced into repelling we only only now as the conservative government actually making some small move towards actually finding out where this money is coming from because the way in which to keep it coming in is to ask no questions. And they're being forced now 
to ask questions. So the money, our way of making a living, might be going somewhere else. And because we don't make anything anymore, what are we going to do? Thanks, John. 0345 6060 973 LBC. Come on, we're running late. 0345 6060 973. I'll be totally fair about this. Who's been waiting the longest? Bromley. Hello, Luke. Hello, hello, hi, good evening. Luke. Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? I, I, hi. Are we on speakerphone? Yeah, I'm just taking your phone. Thanks. Sorry uh -oh. about that. Uh-oh. I'm here. How are oh, you doing? Go ahead. Okay, so my situation, my thoughts were, what would the world have been like if it wasn't for the war? Where would Trudeau be? Where would Boris be? Where would Macron be? Where would Australia be? The way they're treating the people over the pandemic, so-called pandemic. I wonder whether it'd be if it wasn't for this massive distraction. Well, Bodger would probably be, um, you know what, he, he's just so weirdly lucky, he would have probably slipped through, slithered through those travails and uh, survived. Um, as for the rest of them, I don't know. Well, I mean, you say Boris, but the others were far worse in the way they treated the people. At least Boris, um, you know, made, made some whatever, as you mentioned. But uh, look at Trudeau, I mean, he's pressed. The lorry drivers who get them good momentum. Oh, please, those, lo terrible. those lorry drivers, do me a favour. That, that, that's that, that was the pretense of a grassroots campaign. It was absolutely nothing of the sort. It was the usual right-wingers, the, uh, the sort of dark right-wing money that was propelling them to do that. You know, something of the order of 85% of lorry drivers actually had the vaccine. What the hell were they complaining about? Propelled to do it. Nonsense. Don't believe a word of it, Luke. Um, Wandsworth. Hello, Thomas. Hello, well, lad. Thomas. How are you doing, all right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> OK. I, I, I just want to talk about Boris Johnson and the NATO agreement. You want to talk about Boris Johnson and the NATO agreement? I think he should do more. Do more what? I think he needs to negotiate. I think that's another... <laughs> I think he switched his phone off with his earlobe. It's another one of those. It's another earlobe catastrophe. Oh, no. Uh, we'll never know. But thanks a lot, uh, Thomas. That was excellent. Um, Congleton. Hello, David. Hi, good morning. David. Um, yeah, a, f a few things. Uh, Couple of three firstly, things. yeah, right, the first thing, like, uh, I mean, I always, for a long time, I was brought up at working class, you voted Labour, yeah. Right. So then, but what people seem to forget is with the Conservative government, remember when the poll tax first come in? It was, it was £500 per person per household. Right. Right. So out of our house, then my, I think, my mum at the time, I'm not 100% certain, I think our rates on the house was about £600 a year, I think. I can't yeah. just remember perfectly right. Right. But then, there were six of us in our house. Yeah. So our our rates, say, went from £600 a year to £3,000 going out. Right. Because there was, there was me, uh, obviously, me mum, me dad, mm -hmm. me, dad. me brother, brother, and two sisters. A couple of yeah? sisters, yeah. So, yeah, so that was that. that's what people forget about then. And then, you know, when you was going about, you know, about the housing being sold off. Right. Well, if you think about it, it was a very clever ploy. Because if people then, uh, you know, the working, oh, we can buy a house, which uh, we did at a bit later time, um but if you think about it, it was a good ploy because if you've got the good old working class now having to pay for the house, they ain't going to cause as much money, i.e. going on strike. Yes. Be Plus, uh, because pe you if, if you own a house, then you have a, 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 like a, a treasure to, to um, protect. And those who own houses are more likely to vote Conservative than those who don't. Most of them, yeah. I mean, my dad, my mum and dad were still uh, staunch Labour voters. They were, right? But you see, it was like a lot. A lot of people were saying, 
you, you got that thing then, you see, oh, because you've lived in your council house for X number of years, you can get cheaper, right? Yeah. So folk are thinking, right, you know, they've got then got the whole own house and one thing and another, like my mum and dad did. Basically, it was gerrymandering. But, it was a way to rig the polls so that the Conservative Party would just win and win and win. Get people yeah, yeah, out yeah, of yeah. council houses get them to buy their own house at a discount so that everybody was paying for it, but not everybody actually benefited. And if you own your own house or you've got a mortgage on it, then you're more likely to vote Conservative. It was it was just a scam. No, I know, know all about that. Now then, uh, apart from that, now the other one is, right, uh, where I worked for oh, 15, 16 years ago, right, we asked for a bit of a wage rise. Right. And, th- and now uh, there was only... Seven, eight of us worked, worked at this company, a recycling company, hmm. and the first thing that we got told, well, I can get Polish people work cheaper. Yeah. So that that's a smack on the light what they've done now with PR, PR, with ferry lads, isn't it? Right. Same sort of thing. We were but persuaded smaller... to leave the EU to avoid that happening, and uh, to no surprise of, to anybody at all, apart from. I guess uh, ardent um, leavers. The uh, the exact same thing happened. P and O exactly. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. And well, uh, the other the other one is uh, it's like you got Rishi Sumek there. He sits there smiling away, like you say, he's a multi millionaire, <laughs> billionaire. Isn't he? Yeah, well, you know what I mean. And he, isn't he married to a billionaire's daughter? Right. Well, yeah. It's in. It's in the. He's got a billion in the family. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you see, it's like that, you see. I mean, it's like with the, how the fuel prices have been now. I mean, if a gallon of petrol was 50 quid a gallon, it wouldn't make a dent on his pocket. He wouldn't even notice it. No. Um, you know, and uh, we but, and we just ripped off out. We really, at the end of the day, most, um, your normal working folk in this country just get bent over and, and attack, don't you? You know what I mean? Um, and they say, thank you, sir, may I have another? And then they vote Conservative again. It's bizarre. David, I've got to go, but thanks for that. Let's see if I can squeeze one more in. Uh, Hampshire. Hello, Colin. Hi. Colin. Hi. Um, I just wanted to, to go back to your idea of this uh, 10% tax rate. Yes. Um, nobody's ever going to take it to 10%. No, I was just, but... I was just doing it at 10% for ease of, ma- of maths. No, no, I understand that. I do understand that. But the reason why people who have made huge fortunes have been probably started quite modestly, um, like the, 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 the chap with the vacuum cleaners, I mean, he's taken his billions and factories away after being very successful in the UK. Yeah. But the, uh, the point I would like to make to you is that if tax rates were obliterated altogether up to a certain level. In other words, let's say £25,000. Hmm. At 25000 if people had no tax at 25000 but anything over that was then taxed at, say, and I'm just taking a figure off the wall, 30%. Yeah. In my perception, uh, and I do work in this arena, everybody would pay it. Rubbish. Well, you say rubbish because that's a bit too dismissive. Well, it's not dismissive, it's just true. It's human nature. If you had to write a cheque for whatever 30% of, uh, say, £300,000, if you were making that kind of money, um, then you just wouldn't do it. You would do everything in your power to avoid doing that. Just hold on. I don't think that's necessarily true. Absolutely true. There's an entire... Um, infrastructure in the city of London to make that happen so that people who earn that kind of money do not have to pay the tax. And, and it's not that they don't want to pay as much tax, it's that they don't want to pay any tax. Hence the existence of all of these uh, tax havens out in the middle of uh, the uh, bright blue sea with the uh, Union Jack fluttering from their government buildings. It's not that they want to save a little bit of money, they want to save all of the money that they would have paid in tax, Colin, which you must know full well being, as you say, in that business.